I was an agriculturalist, uh, trying to get all I could for the land. But since that time, I've realized that this land is not just a resource to be used and abused. It's something that we have to take care of and look at all of it. We have to go back to the way it was if we're going to save these precious natural resources we've been given to enjoy. Over the last several decades, we've been losing thousands and thousands of acres of our wetland habitats. Oil and gas, livestock production, agricultural producers, you name it. When you look at what the prairie used to be, you've lost all that water storage. The river has some parts that are breathtakingly beautiful, but there are other places you want to cry because it's so dirty. And it's all the same river. Right now, we have an opportunity to take this gem, polish it off, and show it to the world. The situation for fishing in state waters was just terrible, and we decided we were going to do something about it. You got to want to do it. You got to want to be in this business. I've been going out there so long, it's just part of me now. Here's my take. Every bend is a new adventure. It's just you and nature. I'm kind of the steward for this land that's here. Hopefully I leave it better than the way I found it. Good morning, everyone. I'm Cynthia Pickett Stevenson, the board chair of Texan by Nature. We are very pleased to welcome you to the delayed 2020 Conservation Summit. We're thrilled to have each of you join us. We have you here in person and over 300 people registered virtually. So we expect this to be a very significant day. I want to take a moment here and tell you that our wonderful leader, Joni Carswell, has had a, a family emergency and she can't be with us today but let's keep her and her family in our prayers. So for many months, we've been an anticipating this conversation and the opportunities we can, we can do with the information and the, and the great programs that are gonna be featured today for our conservation wranglers. One thing I know is that during this pandemic, I've sought out something normal to go do just to remind myself that this too will end. And nature has been that resource. I mean, the, the springtime with the birds and all of the patterns of nature, the greenness, it has, as our Center for Health and Nature is, is establishing, our health and well-being are tied to nature, so we need to take care of it. And our research studies are gonna advance that, and soon we will have doctors writing prescriptions for time in nature. The, with deep appreciation for our natural resources, we are excited to explore the future of conservation with you all today. We have created a new model together with you all. There are about 100 conservation organizations in Texas, and 95 of them are our partners. We have every facet of industry joined together with us, holding hands to figure out how we can preserve our natural resources for people, for critters, and for our habitat. And we are under significant pressures as we sit here today because others are, are finding what we have in this beautiful state. So today, we need to take the big ideas that you're going to see. We need to join hands together. We need to roll out this model in a way that only Texans by nature can. And we will advance this model across our country and the world. We want to thank our partners and sponsors HEB, Dell Technologies, Enbridge, Marathon Petroleum, Phillips 66, EOG Resources, D.D. Rose, Carolyn and David Miller, the Lida Hill Philanthropies, and our silver and bronze sponsors as well. Your generosity makes us possible 
makes our work possible and our partnerships and our mission will drive the impact for years to come. As you've seen a little piece of from this introductory video, it's in our hands and we're gonna speak for things that have no voice and together we're gonna to make an enormous difference. Today, we want to challenge each of you to listen at, to what these conservation wranglers have done to advance the mission across our great state. And we want you to engage. We want to ask, have you ask yourself, how can I take these, these great actions and conduct and plans that are, you're gonna to witness today and em employ them in my personal lives and in our businesses? So help us and join us in shaping the future of con conservation, nature, business, hand in hand with conservation to change not only Texas, but the world. Now, I'd like to ask Neil Wilkins to come up here and share a few thoughts. Neil. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, I'm your stand-in today for Joni Carswell. Um, not, not the, not the look you you would have if Joni were if Joni were here. But uh, it's what you're going to have to have to put up with. So, um, I'm a board member for Texan by Nature. Been a board member for 10 years. And um, as Cynthia mentioned, we want you to engage in dialogue today. Uh, we set up a Slack channel for everyone to have real-time discussion. And you can join us at, for those of you that aren't here, uh, please join that Slack channel at Conservation Summit, all one word, conservationsummit.slack.com. That's conservationsummit.slack.com. If you prefer, you can also email to info at texanbynature.org with questions. And, but we encourage you to engage live on the, on the Conservation Summit Slack channel. As you're getting connected, I just want to take a moment to extend our deepest appreciation to our partners and sponsors. It goes without saying that 2020 was a difficult year and want to thank each of our partners for helping us continue our work and accelerate conservation across the state of Texas. I'm going to repeat our uh, sponsors and underwriters names just so that you can absorb those and think about what it means to have these types of businesses committed to conservation in Texas. H-E-B. Dell Technologies, Enbridge, Marathon Petroleum, Phillips 66, EOG Resources, Dee Dee Rose, Carolyn and David Miller, Cynthia and Don Stevenson, Lida Hill Philanthropies, and our silver and bronze sponsors as well, which you'll see their names on the screens as we go. Your generosity every year, but especially what you committed during 2020, will help us achieve our vision and seek bigger and bolder visions from 2021 and beyond. These bigger, bolder goals are especially pertinent this year as we celebrate our 10th anniversary. It's been an exciting 10 years, building on the original vision of former First Lady George Bush, no, sorry, former First Lady Laura Bush. Uh, we have 95 conservation partners. These are business partners from every industry in Texas and we have projects that impact all of Texas 254 counties. Our dream of bringing conservation and business together to act as an accelerator for conservation and a strategic resource for business is well on its way. Over the next 10 years, we envision every single Texan and every single business taking part in conservation. This will be conservation and stewardship of our state's natural resources. And if you think about the, the enormity of our state, 177 million acres, that means that each and every single one of you will need to be engaged. I'll keep uh, this next part brief so that we can get right into the content of the day, but I'd like to set the tone of the summit, which is the future of conservation. I hope you're thinking about this and I hope you're curious I hope you're joining us today because you're interested in what it takes to make Texas the model of conservation into the future. I hope you're joining us because you want to be a part of this model and shape the future of the conservation efforts that we have here in Texas. I hope you're joining because you're proud to be Texan by nature. 
We're lucky to live in a state prosperous in economy, natural resources, and people. We have the opportunity to explore today and how bringing these benefits together in a way that is much more than one plus one plus one equals three. So what is the future of conservation? Tough to us, it is collaboration, it's innovation, it's economics, it's gaining a positive return on conservation for the people of the state of Texas. It's private, it's public, and it's using resources in imaginative new ways. It's true deep partnerships and commitment between everyone such that conservation is not a separate project, group, or conversation, but part of our state's DNA. Conservation must be a part of who we are as citizens, family members, leaders, entrepreneurs, and humans. It's a partnership that yields innovation and returns that positively shape our resources, health, and economy. As we continue to define and evolve the definition and example of the future of conservation, I challenge you to engage today through these programs. How does each project apply to you? How can their learnings, ideas, and innovations be utilized in your home, in your business, and in your community? Ask yourself, what if? What if each of us met someone new today? What if we each looked at a project in a different way? What if we each modeled something we learned here today and reached out to collaborate with those who are doing it now? Join us today in shaping the future of conservation. For each panel today, and we'll have three panels, I'll introduce all four speakers and we'll share the presentation in succession. After the final speaker, we'll have time for live Q&A for all panelists, so we have people joining us remotely. Our first panel covers collaborative conservation. Collaboration is widely proven to achieve better results, more innovative solutions, deeply engaged team members, high loyalty and morale. Research shows that teams working collaboratively stick to the task 64% longer than those in solitary endeavors. They report higher engagement levels, they cite lower fatigue levels, and have a higher success rate. Collaborative conservation spanning business, landowners, communities, and natural resource organizations yield similar positive results. With our diversity of ecosystems, industry, and people, we have an opportunity to model a future that builds on collaborative efforts, where we learn from one another, build upon new ideas, and utilize our expertise to the fullest. Today, we'll learn from best-in-class examples of collaboration, detailing landowner, community, industry, and NGO liaisons that result in big impact, from youth, energy, urban, and rural development these projects exemplify broad, far-reaching goals and impact. During this session, you'll hear from Melinda Taylor and Billy Tarrant from the Respect Big Bend Coalition. You'll hear from Karen Beadle, Vice President of ESG and Stakeholder Engagement from Marathon Petroleum. You'll hear from Sarah Coles from Texas Children in Nature. You'll hear from Julia Murphy, Deputy Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of San Antonio. Please join me in thanking, thanking these presenters as we start the panel. I'm Melinda Taylor. I'm on the faculty of the University of Texas School of Law, and I'm part of the Mitchell Foundation's Respect Big Bend team. I'm delighted to be able to talk to you today about our Respect Big Bend program, and so honored to be able to present along with the other recipients of the um, Texan by Nature Conservation Wrangler recognition. We so appreciate um, being recognized as a conservation wrangler. So I'm going to talk to you today about Respect Big Bend, which is an, an initiative that the Mitchell Foundation launched a couple of years ago um, to empower communities to participate in decisions about energy siting in Texas. First part of my presentation, I'll just tell you a little bit about RBB, why the foundation started the, the project, 
And then um, I'll talk in a bit more detail about what Respect Big Bend is, um, including the development by design framework that we use in the project. And I'll focus um, even more on our stakeholder and community engagement efforts, which are really the heart and soul of our, of our project. So as I've mentioned, the Cynthia George Mitchell Foundation initiated Respect Big Bend and have funded um, a great deal of the work of RBB. Um, Mr. Mitchell was a leader in the oil and gas industry in Texas. He was um, he pioneered the combined use of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracking to enable a lot of uh, oil and gas in very tight shale formations um, to be commercially uh, produced. And he was also a very committed sustainability and conservation advocate. So this project and other work that's funded by the Mitchell Foundation is a reflection of his commitment and Mrs. Mitchell's commitment uh, to sustainability. So in Texas, we have a lot of big open spaces, especially in West Texas, iconic, beautiful places that people not from Texas assume uh, look like the rest of Texas. And we know that that's not the case. These places are increasingly rare um, across our state, but in West Texas, they still dominate the landscape. Um, a few years ago, the Mitchell Foundation recognized that even these beautiful, out of the way, remote locations with all this, this unique um, biodiversity and, and other values could potentially be impacted by energy development down the road. Um, energy is a vitally important industry to our state. We're the largest oil and gas producer in the country. Um, we're also the largest wind energy producer in the country. And our solar sector is growing dramatically. Nobody expects that to change. Um, but as we continue to produce more and more energy in Texas, there's more and more of a threat um, to these iconic places. And just an importance in making sure that um, when, if and when energy is developed, um, in these far reaches of our state, it's done so in a way that uh, respects the community's values and minimizes any of the negative impacts that can come with energy development. We focused on the Trans-Pecos ecoregion, the area west of the Pecos River, which contains um, some very diverse landscapes, everything from desert grasslands to scrublands to high elevation mountain habitat, sky islands that provide important habitat for species you don't find anywhere else in our state, like black bear or mountain lions. Um, it's also a region that's important um, for the dark skies that are found out in West Texas. I'm sure most of you are aware that the McDonald Observatory, which is part of the University of Texas system, um, is in the Davis Mountains, just um, uphill from Fort Davis, and it contains some of the darkest skies in North America. And as a result, it's a, um, a destination place for researchers, astronomers from all over the world who go there to use the telescopes and, and the system. Um, the research system there. The communities of West Texas, Fort Davis and Alpine and Marfa are all unique. Um, they have their own personalities. They are tourist destinations. They're places where visitors from all over Texas and people from outside Texas go to experience the great outdoors or go to hear live music or see art or film movies. Um, there have been a number of, of uh, sort of famous movies filmed in and around Marfa, especially with Giant and No Country for Old Men and, and others. But they're unique places. Um, they're, they've been kind of isolated from the energy development that's occurred at a more intense pace up in the Permian Basin to their Northeast. Um, but again, they've been, some of the residents of these communities have been concerned about the potential for energy development to come their way in the future. The Mitchell Foundation commissioned some uh, public opinion research before we put the RBB project together. And without going into a lot of the details of that research, we the big takeaways for us were that First of all, the residents of Texas, including far west Texas, um, respect the energy industry, understand how important energy is to our state economy, 
and they welcome development in a you know in the in a broad sense um, in our state. On the other hand, residents are aware of and concerned about potential negative impacts that can, so can accompany energy development, damage to infrastructure, the potential for water contamination, uh, crime, which they associate with um, an influx of workers or people, you know, just the population growing in an area, <clears throat> and price inflation. Um, that's a phenomenon, of course, that Midland and Odessa experienced um, in Pecos and in other towns in West Texas during the recent oil boom, you know, with the price of hotel rooms skyrocketing, housing going up, and the like. And residents are concerned about that, and they raise those concerns. So the RBB project was put together really to try to give the stakeholders, the community members in West Texas, um, a, a vantage point or a platform from which they could first articulate what's most important to them about their region and then also provide input to the energy sector um, if and when energy development um, speeds up and, and potentially in fact in, in impacts their region. So the foundation funded a variety of organizations with strong science and technical expertise as well as um, skills with communications and public opinion research and outreach skills to policymakers and the like. And we it, obtained some very important funding as well from other foundations, the Meadows Foundation, the Permian Basin Area Foundation, the King Foundation, and the Stillwater Foundation. And we're very grateful to all of those funders for their support. The group developed a mission statement, which again reflects that balance that I keep talking about, that recognition that responsible energy development is something to be encouraged in Texas, um, but it's also important for stakeholders to have an opportunity to um, articulate the things about their, their region that they hold most dear and provide input about to decision making about energy development. Our study area was the 18 county area um, that's outlined here in, in black. Um, it's the Trans-Pecos region, essentially. Um, it includes the Permian Basin, so our research included the areas that are kind of in the heart of the Permian, um, as well as these areas of far west Texas, the Tri-County area, um, where there's been very little energy development to date. The stakeholder advisory group that we put together, though, all comes from the Tri-County area, from Presidio, Brewster, and Jeff Davis counties. We know um, and have always known since we started this project how important it is to engage the community. And in addition to just getting the best information possible about um, you know, what, what resources, what aspects of their communities are most important to the residents there, it's a way to build buy-in um, to the process and to the outcomes of the process so that what we produce through this project won't be a report that just goes on somebody's shelf and gathers dust over time, but actually is a living um, tool that, that these communities and, and others can avail themselves of um, going forward. So we put together a stakeholder advisory group early on um, with representatives that are landowners and mineral owners, um, representatives from uh, the oil and gas industry, as well as the renewable sector, um, conservation organizations and state agencies, Texas Parks and Wildlife um, in particular, and then community members who were not large landowners, but people who, um, county commissioner, for example, a minister, um, a business owner, others who live in these communities and um, care about their long-term uh, sustainability and desirability. The stakeholder advisory group defined its roles and responsibilities, and um, which we, I've listed here. Note that we have worked throughout from, from the very beginning to minimize um, politics in these discussions. This isn't about promoting one type of energy over another or anything like that. Um, this is meant to be as constructive a process as possible. And we have wanted our SAG members to speak freely and share their thoughts and perspectives and um, objections when they have them um, as we go through the process. 
We also held a series of landowner workshops with people um, outside the SAG to educate them about what we were doing and a seminar series, which initially was uh, live and eventually had to, to be converted to, um, to Zoom, unfortunately, but had good attendance at, these, at those events. So having gathered lots of information from our stakeholder advisory group and other members of the public, we launched the development by design framework, which involves the steps that are described or listed here on this slide. Um, and the first of those steps is to, to develop a conservation vision for the region. So our SAG spent quite a bit of time um, talking about those, those attributes of the Tri-County area that they care most about and that they want to protect going forward. This is three of the most three of the conservation values that they identified. There, there were three or four others, but um, the ranching heritage and private property rights is sort of the umbrella under which everything else um, falls because they all the members of the SAG, whether they were landowners or not, um, said over and over again how important it was to preserve large intact ranches um, because those are the, the places where the other values that the communities um, enjoy come from. This is a, a, a part of, you know, Texas is 95% privately owned and that applies just as, as, as much in West Texas as anywhere else, despite the existence of um, Big Bend National Park and a couple of other parks out there. Still, a lot of the important places are found on private lands. Then we took the, the information we had gleaned from the SAG and represented those values through a, spatially and on these maps. And this was a, a pretty involved process that was led by the Nature Conservancy, um, very interesting process that resulted in um, a cumulative values map that I'm showing you here. And without going into a lot of detail about this, suffice it to say that the more green an area is, the more values are associated with that area. So it's um, those areas are valued for habitat, for um, ranching heritage, for dark skies, et cetera. Um, so you can see that the Tri-County area where our SAG um, came from is sort of disproportionately green, or there, there is a lot of important conservation um, areas in that Tri-County area. We also projected future um, energy development. So both oil and gas, this is actually a map of previous oil and gas development in the Tri-County area, but we, we made projections looking forward and um, you're not expected to read the numbers on that table, but the Bureau of Economic Geology led this work and they estimated based on the geology of the region the uh, wind speeds and sort of wind resources, as well as the solar radiation and the slope of the areas, how many acres were potentially suitable for various types of energy development. That was their contribution to the project. So again, going back to this development by design, there was the creation of a conservation vision, projection of energy, uh, future energy development, and then the place where those two factors over, overlap, where there might be development, for example, in a place that has a high conservation value, those places are identified as areas of potential um, impact where mitigation would be appropriate, avoidance or mitigation. We're currently in the process of finalizing our report with the stakeholder advisory group. Um, it was presented to the SAG uh, last week at the most recent stakeholder advisory group meeting. And we'll be unfold, un, unveiling that and kind of rolling it out to the community and to the state at large over the next few weeks. <clears throat> We've had a very high level of engagement throughout this process from, from the SAG members, as well as other members of the community at those landowner workshops and, um, and the seminar series. So we, we feel really good about uh, where, where we are with this process. I think it's been enormously rewarding uh, to work with the stakeholder advisory group and to hear their perspective about what's most important to them um, in their region. 
So I think the big takeaways for us are that um, we've developed a decision framework through this development by design process that certainly could be uh, developed in other parts of the state um, where there's either ongoing or the potential for new energy development. It's also a tool that can be used to prioritize areas for restoration, whether that's to connect um, areas that are currently fragmented um, from a habitat standpoint or um, to improve habitat for species or improve water quality, um, whatever the objective is. This type of spatial tool, I think, can be very useful. Um, the, the fact that the process was driven by the stakeholders and reflects their values and what they hold most important, I think, is going to result in a, in a product that has a long shelf life. And we hope to be able to um, use the product to help individual landowners um, in the future and contribute to decisions about energy siting that the energy companies themselves are engaged in. Um, in Texas, there's not a regulatory process through which stakeholders have a say about energy siting, and that, that's a choice that policymakers have made. But we think through this sort of cooperative knowledge sharing initiative um, that, again, is driven by the people who are going to be affected by energy development, um, we can give them a voice going forward. So thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to present to you all today and look forward to your Hello, I'm Karen Beadle with Marathon Petroleum. I serve as the Vice President of ESG, or Environment, Social, and Governance, as well as Stakeholder Engagement. My business card is an 8x10. I lead a team that drives Marathon strategies for stakeholder engagement, sustainability reporting, community investment, media, and issues management. To begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Marathon, or MPC. We started in 1887 and have been in business for more than 130 years. We're headquartered in Findlay, Ohio, with national operations across refining, midstream, which includes natural gas gathering and processing, pipelines, logistics, and energy storage, among other things, as well as retail marketing. MPC currently operates 13 refineries in 12 states with 2.9 million barrels per day of refining capacity. Our MPLX operates midstream energy infrastructure and provides fuel distribution services. We have 7,100 branded retail outlets in 35 states, the District of Columbia, and Mexico that are run by independent entrepreneurs. And we've been expanding the volume of renewable fuels we produce and market. We strive to be an industry leader in sustainability by emphasizing environmental and social responsibility with safe and reliable operations. Our commitment to sustainability means creating shared value with our many stakeholders, empowering people to achieve more, contributing to progress in our communities, and protecting the environment we all share. MPC was just recognized for the fourth year in a row as a U.S. EPA Energy Star Partner of the Year, and we were the only recipient in our industry to receive the Sustained Excellence Award. In communities where we operate, we're committed to engaging our stakeholders and doing our part to improve the lives and well-being of our neighbors and community members. In 2020, which was such a trying year for all of us, MPC invested more than $17 million in our communities between the MPC Foundation, company giving, and employee donations and the company matching programs. Most recently, building on our company's commitment to sustainability and lowering carbon intensity, we increased our renewable fuel production with facilities in Dickinson, North Dakota, Cincinnati, Ohio, and a facility under development in Martinez, California. Our aim is to significantly lower greenhouse gas emissions, air pollutants, and water use. We were also the first independent U.S. downstream company to establish a greenhouse gas emissions intensity reduction target. The target is to reduce GHG emissions intensity 30% by 2030 from 2014 levels, and it's linked to employee and executive compensation. We're grateful for our significant presence in Texas, a great place to live and work. 
We have two refineries, as well as multiple logistics operations, including gas processing and crude gathering, with a significant presence in the Permian Basin. We have transport and rail operations in Texas and an office in San Antonio, which is home to approximately 1,500 employees, including me. Our Galveston Bay refinery is located in Texas City off the entrance to Houston Ship Channel. With 1,800 employees, GBR has a refining capacity of 593,000 barrels per calendar day. MPC supports many programs, organizations, and initiatives that work to protect our environment in the Texas City region. We're proud to be a Texan by Nature certified site and have four sites certified by the Wildlife Habitat Council. Our refinery actively supports the local United Way, the Galveston County Fair and Rodeo, and the Galveston Bay Area Habitat for Humanity, to name a few. Our El Paso refinery is located three miles east of downtown El Paso. With 440 employees, the El Paso refinery has a refining capacity of approximately 131,000 barrels per calendar day. This refinery was one of the first in the U.S. to install a wet gas scrubber to reduce emissions and is equipped with a flare gas recovery system which eliminates continuous waste gas flaring. It's a priority of ours to be actively involved in efforts that have a positive impact on the El Paso community. MPC provides $1.5 million in annual community investment funds to nonprofit organizations in El Paso and the Permian Basin. Our approach to sustainability spans the environmental, social, and governance dimensions of our operations. It encompasses our commitment to creating shared value with our many stakeholders. Through strategic investment and innovation, we can play a role in helping society achieve economic growth, environmental preservation, and resource conservation to address the needs of future generations. We operate with a spirit of safety and environmental stewardship, integrity, respect, inclusion, and collaboration. These principles and a commitment to open and ongoing dialogue guide how we approach stakeholder engagement. We value the positive relationships built with our local communities. At each of our sites, we seek to understand our stakeholders' goals, projects, and concerns, and then incorporate that feedback into our business strategies. Through these partnerships with communities, leaders, and nonprofits, we have been able to play a part in some far-reaching projects to conserve natural resources, restore habitats, and protect endangered species. I'd like to share a few of these projects as examples of collaborative conservation. The Paso del Norte Trail is roughly a 68-mile county-wide trail located in El Paso County. A portion of this trail, about 8.3 miles, is not far from our El Paso refinery. The development of this trail was a community-driven, collaborative effort between the Paso del Norte Health Foundation, Paso del Norte Community Foundation, and City of El Paso. This trail supports conservation and ecotourism by preserving the history and culture of the region and making healthy living an easy choice for this unique, binational community. I'm happy to share that a grant from the MPC Foundation, along with the support of private and public resources, created a regional amenity for all to enjoy. Currently, 22 miles of the trail is complete. An array of wildlife can be found along the Paso del Norte Trail, including the burrowing owls. These owls are the smallest of their species. In fact, they are a little larger than a robin. Unlike most owls, they are very active during the day and they nest in underground burrows. These owls, instead of flying away, often run or flatten themselves against the ground when disturbed. Literally, this is collaborative conservation in our backyard. The Texas hornshell mussel was added to the list of endangered and threatened species in March of 2018 by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The Texas hornshell is a freshwater mussel that was once easily found in free-flowing rivers and streams in southern New Mexico and the Rio Grande River Basin in Texas. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that the hornshell currently occupies only 15% of its historical range. 
Marathon Petroleum Logistics partnered with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the U.S. Bureau of Land Management, and the nonprofit conservation organization Center of Excellence in a candidate conservation agreement to protect the Texas hornshell mussel and other covered species in the Permian Basin. MPC was able to contribute funds in support of research as well as training designed to protect the species. Marathon Petroleum Logistics uses a non-traditional method to transplant the Brack's fishhook cactus and Brack hardwell cactus. During the winter, the cacti are removed when dormant. We carefully store them and they are relocated in the spring. While currently the number of transplants is small, the percentage of survival is noteworthy. We're looking into a process to transplant larger numbers of Brax cacti using the same timing and techniques, which we hope leads to better transplant protocol and survival rates. Our hope is that our methodology could be adopted by state and government entities and our data be picked up by a university partner. This is still a work in progress. Our Galveston Bay refinery is a supporter of the Texas City Prairie Preserve which is a 2,300-acre nature preserve of Moses Lake and Galveston Bay in Texas City. The Nature Conservancy's Prairie Preserve is a great example of native coastal tall grass prairie management and stewardship. The preserve is home to over 280 species of birds, 300 plants, and harvests over 5,000 pounds of native seed for restoration efforts both on and off the preserve. The Nature Conservancy safeguards this rare habitat and engages the community to develop restoration strategies that can be applied across the greater Houston-Galveston region. MPC is proud to partner with the Nature Conservancy. In addition to providing a grant, our refinery's wildlife habitat team worked with the Texas Nature Conservancy and the Galveston Bay Foundation to plant marsh grass erosion. This section of shoreline was receding by one foot each year. Another of the Nature Conservancy's great programs is the Houston Healthy Cities program, which focuses on bringing nature to all people. This program has been by creating partnerships across the city with organizations like the Houston Climate Action Plan, Houston's Complete Communities, and the cities connecting children with nature. Collectively, these two programs are looking to act by establishing on-the-ground projects in conjunction with the Regional Prairie Preserve, of which Texas City Prairie Preserve is a cornerstone. This is just another example of the collaborative conservation. Finally, discarded fishing lines can be harmful to marine wildlife as well as boats. Animals, especially birds, cannot see the line in the water or on the ground. They become tangled in the line, which can lead to starvation, loss of a limb, or drowning. With the Galveston Bay Area chapter of the Texas Master Naturalists, MPC worked to install 96 new recycling locations for the monofilament, or fishing line, across Galveston County. The new collection tubes were accompanied by signs that explain what the stations are for, why they are important, and how to use them. This information was presented in four different languages. We're grateful to have this opportunity to work together to care for our environment and wildlife. Our sustainability commitment is really about concrete actions and partnerships that empower people, contribute to progress in our communities, and conserve the natural resources we all share. I would like to close by thanking all of the organizations that have partnered with us on these many outstanding initiatives that bring to life what collaborative conservation can really mean. Hi, welcome. Um, my name is Sarah Coles. I'm the executive director of the Texas Children and Nature Network. And our mission is to ensure equitable access and connection to nature for all children in Texas. We envision a Texas where children and their families from all walks of life will spend more time outdoors, engaging with nature for a healthier, happier, and smarter Texas. So why do we have this mission of kids spending time outdoors? So kids who spend time outdoors are happier, healthier, and smarter. And we know this through some of our research that shows that kids are healthier physically and mentally, do better in school, have higher self-esteem, have good self-discipline, 
are great problem solvers, are more competitive with others, are more creative, feel connected to nature. And for Texan and Nature, Texan by Nature's mission, they're tomorrow's conservation leaders. And so it's really important for us to really instill this love in nature in children in Texas, because we know that we have so many kids in Texas. Um, statistics show that 10% of the United States' school age population lives in Texas. And so we have a lot of kids that we are looking to work with. And those kids, most of them, pre-pandemic numbers, were spending seven to eight hours a day in front of screens. We don't know what those numbers are looking like now with more virtual school. Um, my assumption is those numbers have just skyrocketed. But so if the kids are spending seven to eight hours a day on screens, how much are they spending outdoors? Well, most kids are spending about an hour a week outdoors. And so we know that with all of these influences that going out in nature has, we need to have that number go up. So in 2009, um, the Texas legislature resolved um, to address the problem of nature deficit disorder. That's the idea that kids aren't spending enough time outdoors and it's negatively affecting their physical and mental health. And so they created a working group between Texas Parks and Wildlife and the Texas Education Agency. And out of this group, leaders from across the state in nature education gathered and formed the Texas Children in Nature Network in 2010. In January 1st, um, the Texas Children in Nature Network became an independent nonprofit. We do have an MOA with Texas Parks and Wildlife as a founding partner and still office out of headquarters in Austin. So back in 2010, we had a strategic plan and we had just finished rewriting our 2021 plan. Um, those are available to anyone who is interested. I'll share my contact information at the end. Um, but we have eight strategic areas of interest. And these are areas that we feel like have big impact on kids' lives. And we wanna lean into these areas. The, so the first is education. So we wanna work with both formal and informal educators and kids in and out of school time. So the time that they're in school, how are they spending time outdoors when they're at the school building? But then out of school, how are they spending time in after school programs, during summer camps, addressing all of those um, aspects of a kid's life, health. We really believe, and I think this last year has really shown that nature can be a public health strategy. At the beginning of the pandemic, what we were hearing was go outdoors, spend time outside, go exercise outdoors. And that's really true. We as humans get so many benefits from spending time outdoors. In fact, the latest research is showing that green exercise, the idea of exercising outdoors is twice as healthy for you as exercising in a gym. And so it's not just the cardiovascular and strength building that you're getting from doing exercise, but there's also mental benefits and your body is absorbing vitamin D. You're getting all of the great benefits from being outdoors through that time. So we are working with doctors, nurses, public health professionals, mental health professionals, the whole gamut to try and make health, nature a public health strategy. Next, we work in community groups. So these are kind of that third space. So a lot of families um, rely on their teachers, their schools to help with their kids. They rely on health professionals, their pediatricians, their dentists, all of those people to help with raise their kids. And then there's this third group. And these are things like church groups, scouts, YMCAs, boys and girls clubs that are kind of in this third space that really affect a family's life. So we work with those groups. Next is access. So if you haven't already heard today, I'm sure you will hear that we in Texas have about 5% public land. Um, that's a lot lower than a lot of other states. And with that, we have a lot of people. I already said that we have 10% of the US's school age population. So we are working with private landowners, with public agencies to increase access to land for kids. So some great examples is we work with some private landowners that open up their land for school groups to go out there. We work with state agencies like Texas Parks and Wildlife for kids to go outdoors. We work with municipalities to get kids outdoors. We work with the whole gamut. We also work combining our education and access, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, 
on getting more nature on school campuses. So that involves the ISD, the GLO, local municipalities, all of those groups working together to get more access for kids to, to nature. We also know that not all nature experiences are created equal. And so we really work to get access to places that may not have nature access, but then also work on making that nature welcoming for everyone who comes. So we work in the equity sphere that way. We also know that the, we need more leaders in this field across the state. And so we work really strong, hard on getting more leaders growing up in this nature space. We have lots of groups that we work with that work with high school students and getting them excited to go into conservation careers. Lastly, for our last plan, we work in marketing. And so how are we telling people the story of nature and telling that story of getting more kids outdoors? But the one that we added with this 2021 plan is policy. How can we affect policy change and helping get more kids outdoors? Everything from recess guidelines to adding more nature space across the state. These are great things that we're working on. So none of this can happen without collaboration. We are a small nonprofit. In fact, it's me. Um, I have a great board, but in terms of staff, it's just one staff member. And I couldn't do any of this without our great partners. We have over 600 partner organizations across the state. And with that, we work off of what's called the collective impact model. And this has a few core tenets. First, we have a common agenda. We're all working really hard to get more kids outdoors. And we know that the only way to do that is by working together. This problem is so vast that no one organization can do it all by themselves. So we work with each other and we believe that a rising tide raises all boats. And we work really hard to get that working together happen. We have mutually reinforcing activities. So this means that I share everything that all of our partners are doing with all of our partners. We have emails that go out that are highlighting our partners. I share a ton of resources with our partners, including monthly webinars that we do where we're sharing resources. Some great examples of ones that we just had was one where we learned about what programs are going on in the state. There was a great tool where you can look and see what programs are happening here. Where can my organization lean in in an area that is not being served? We also share things like nature journaling practices and how to um, work with kids that are in public housing um, units. These are all great examples of things that we've done through our workshops. We also have continuous communication. We send out newsletters. We have four social media sites that we actively update and so much more. We also, I spend a lot of my time connecting partners. So sometimes I'll have a day where I am on a call with three different cities, with three different municipalities all working on the same problem and they're able to work together and hear from each other what's been working in their city and therefore move that needle forward that much faster because no one's having to reinvent the wheel. Everyone's working together on this common agenda of getting more kids outdoors. And the last bit is this strong backbone organization and that's us. Um, my job is to connect people. I often joke that I'm a professional matchmaker. My job is to hear, hey, this is what Texan by Nature is doing and this is what the Texas Forest Service is doing. Let's get them in a room together and talk to each other and figure out how they can work together and make a great program. We do this not just with me, but also with our eight regional collaboratives. Each of these regional collaboratives has a regional leader that works really closely with me and they are tied in to that network in their locality and they are really knowing what each partner organization is doing and therefore they can really dig in to creating that collaborative model. Um, so we have regional collaboratives in Caprock. So that you'll see here on the map is this orange section. It's a big section of the state and we're working on making that a little bit more doable for that region. But then we also have a North Texas region. So that's the DFW area. We've got Austin, San Antonio, Piney Woods is this green area in the corner here. And that is um, 
College Station, Lufkin, Nacogdoches, they're all included in that. We have Houston. The coastal bend is this light blue area. And that's basically from Matagorda down to Kingsville. Um, and then lastly, we have the lower Rio Grande Valley. Um, all of these regions are really active and have great opportunities to connect with partners. So if you're in any of those regions and you wanna connect with our regional collaboratives, please let me know. We have a few big programs that we work on. Nature Rocks, it's a suite of websites where we highlight all of the programs our, nature, our partners are doing, going back to that resource sharing. We have three cities connecting children to nature projects in the state. This is where we are working specifically with these municipalities to put nature into their infrastructure and working to connect all of those partners in their cities. We have Ole Texas. This is an initiative that is through DSHS and it's putting nature in early childcare centers across the state. So reaching our smallest Texans and getting them started on loving nature and becoming conservationists early. We have a school social media toolkit. This is a program that we have partnered with Texan by Nature on. Um, we have created this toolkit that goes out to ISDs across the state on how to engage with their families and getting kids outdoors, going back to that education pillar that we work in. The Texas Nature Challenge, where we are challenging families from across the state to go spend time outdoors every day. We have lots of fun challenges that are up and enough to keep you busy for the whole year. And lastly, kind of what I talked to, alluded to earlier, the green schoolyards. So we work with schools, we work with municipalities and getting those nature spaces in neighborhoods that may not have a local park, but they have an elementary school or they have a middle school and we can put nature space on those schoolyards. So thank you so much everyone for listening to me today. I'll be around for some Q&A in a little bit, but here's my contact information. Please email me or call me if you have any questions. I'm happy to talk about children in nature every day. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Julia Murphy and I am the Deputy Chief Sustainability Officer for the City of San Antonio. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today and present on the future of conservation through collaborative partnerships. When you think of San Antonio, you may think of the Alamo or even the best Tex-Mex in the state. But we are also so proud of the fact that in 2020, we were recognized as a Texan by Nature 20 honoree in the municipal services sector. And we're thrilled to be included in the company of the other honorees working on conservation, natural resource protection, and sustainability initiatives across our beautiful state of Texas. In our work, we know that collaboration is essential to achieving our goals. And while we rely on internal and external partnerships to advance policy programs and projects in energy efficiency, transportation, and climate education, today I'd like to focus on a few recent initiatives that are helping to advance our commitment to the protection of native species in Texas. In late 2019, San Antonio passed its first climate action and adaptation plan with a goal to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 in line with the Paris Climate Accord. This occurred after newly elected Mayor Ron Nuremberg, a champion of climate action, made this one of his first legislative priorities. The following May, San Antonio was designated a U.S. pioneer in the recently initiated Cities with Nature International Platform established by ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability. Cities with Nature is beginning to convene local governments around the world who prioritize nature-based solutions to climate change, recognize ecosystem services, and provide equitable access to nature and the outdoors. Quoting Mayor Ron Nirenberg, we know that caring for nature is essential to a sustainable future. Naturally, we celebrate this initiative and look forward to working together as stewards of our planet. Like the mayor said in San Antonio, it is recognized that conservation is key to community resilience and natural resource regeneration, specifically the air, 
water, soil, and native plants and animals on which we all depend and that are essential to our quality of life. San Antonio's Climate Action and Adaptation Plan prioritizes green infrastructure, biodiversity, and healthy ecosystems. The three projects you're about to hear about enhance the goals of both the municipality and community partners, while also educating and empowering the greater community. These three projects are the North American Friendship Garden, San Antonio's recent Bird City designation, an initiative of Texas Parks and Wildlife and Audubon, and the Mayor's Youth Engagement Council for Climate Initiatives. Last October, the World Affairs Council of San Antonio and the City of San Antonio's Global Engagement Office co-hosted a two-part Biodiversity Without Borders program focused on sustainable policies in North American cities, as well as the announcement of the establishment of a new North American Friendship Garden. Policy experts and local government representatives from Montreal, Guadalajara, and San Antonio convened virtually to discuss environmental conservation work being done in their respective cities. It took place during our annual Monarch Butterfly and Pollinator Festival. We are fortunate to have a legacy of conservation initiatives in San Antonio. All of these initiatives are supported by the local government and include the Alamo Area Monarch Collaborative, Monarch and Pollinator Festival, Bracken Cave Bat Preserve, the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program, San Antonio River Improvements, the Linear Greenway Trail System, Mitchell Lake Audubon Center, San Antonio Missions National Historical Park, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and most recently, the Phil Hardberger Park Land Bridge, which connects two sides of an urban park over a busy highway and is the largest wildlife crossing constructed to date in the United States. And soon we'll be adding to this list the North American Friendship Garden. Why North American? Because as you can see from the map on the left, the central flyway stretches over 5,000 miles through three countries. The central flyway is used by hundreds of birds, butterflies, and other migratory species. And Texas sits right in the middle of it. The garden will be located on the banks of the San Antonio River at Confluence Park. It will be a space for native plants and pollinators and other wildlife to rest and refuel during their migratory journeys, and for human visitors to learn about and appreciate them. <clears throat> With an unveiling planned for May 2021, the 2,500 square foot garden will feature plants to support pollinators, art benches, a seed library, and even a bug hotel. Thousands of families and students who visit Confluence Park every year will find even more value about pollinators, insects, and the urgency for urban conservation. As Consul General of Mexico, Dr. Ruben Minuti said, the North American Friendship Garden reflects the long-standing, healthy, and productive relationship between the States and Mexico. Our government is very pleased to celebrate our trilateral ties with this garden, a true symbol of friendship, solidarity, and cooperation between our countries. The next value you about is San Antonio's certification as a bird city. San Antonio, Galveston, and Surfside Beach joined Bastrop, Dallas, Houston, and Port Aransas as bird cities this past January. This community-focused certification program was created people protect birds and their habitats where we live, work, and recreate. In addition to recognizing World Migratory Bird Day, achieving Texas Parks and Wildlife's Bird City certification includes creating and protecting bird-friendly native and educating and building awareness in the community. World Migratory Bird Day is celebrated annually at the Mitchell Lake Audubon Center on the south side of San Antonio. 
And here's a list of the many community collaborators and contributors to this effort. Owl Monster Naturalists, Bear Audubon Society, City of San Antonio, Eco Centro at San Antonio College, Friends of San Antonio Natural Areas, Headwaters at Incarnate Word, Mitchell Lake Audubon Center, Native Plant Society of Texas, San Antonio River Authority, San Antonio Water, Texas Parks and Wildlife, and many more. Finally, we are so proud of launching the Mayor's Youth Engagement Council for Climate Initiatives. The first council was formed last fall with 35 area youth representing all city council districts and 23 schools, including public, private. The goal of the council is to empower students by increasing their knowledge in sustainability and climate action in San Antonio, as well as to further their knowledge around climate and racial justice, mitigation and adaptation strategies, advocacy, and the public policy process. Led and facilitated by EcoRISE, with support from the City of San Antonio Mayor of Sustainability, the Council's mission is to empower San Antonio's next generation of climate champions with the tools that they need to become effective advocates in their communities. Students will be doing further research within four themes, housing and transportation, biodiversity, infrastructure, including energy and recycling, and community health and food security. The council was made possible by a grant from the Holloman Price Foundation, facilitated through San Antonio's participation in the American Cities Climate Challenge. I think this quote from Mayor Ron Nuremberg perfectly sums up the future of conservation through collaborative partnerships. He says, Empowering our youth may be the single most important strategy we can take to address the climate crisis. Harnessing the creativity, brain power, and energy of students who live in our community means that they can help craft solutions for their future in San Antonio. And I think the world. Thank you again for the opportunity to share some details about collaborative conservation in San Antonio. I appreciate your time and attention today. Okay, I think you can agree with me that all of those were pretty significant projects. Um, if if we could, we've got uh, panelists that will join us both remotely, and then we've got one celebrity panelist here, <laughs> Billy Tarrant, who you can see an actual person. So um, we will, I think we've got maybe one more that will join us on screen. And I think they're on this screen right here. So we have, okay, we have them all. We have Karen. Julia Murphy, we have Sarah Coles and Billy Tarrant. So this is an opportunity um, for questions for these panelists. Um, you can address them to, to individual panelists if you'd like, or we can, uh, you can have a question that would go out to all of the, the panelists. I've got, uh, I've got one to start off with for uh, Sarah Coles. Sarah, your uh, Texas Children in Nature uh, new plan that has eight goals and strategies to it. Uh, I noticed that you really took, a, took note of uh, policy being one area in which you really wanted to put emphasis. What one policy initiative would advance Texas Children in Nature the most? No, that's a great question. Um, I think for us right now, one of the things that we really think with everything that's happened this past year with COVID and um, children starting to go back to school more 100% in person is outdoor classrooms. Um, having significant outdoor space on all of our school campuses is really going to make a drastic difference in the most amount of kids' lives in Texas. 
We have um, several schools throughout the state that already have implemented green schoolyards projects, where these are instances where it's a garden, which we've seen a lot of schools starting to have, but then also adding habitat areas, rain gardens, spaces that are specifically meant for kids to have unstructured play outdoors and explore the outdoors, but also be a fantastic place where teachers can take their classes outside and teach virtually every subject. Um, with that in mind, we've also been doing a lot of um, teacher workshops where we are working with teachers, um, not just science teachers, but teachers from all subjects on how to teach outdoors and really increase the amount of time that children are spending outside. Um, we know that, that any amount of time they spend outside just really improves their um, academic performance um, during the school day. That's great. Uh, don't forget, any of, the, of you that are joining us on the Slack channel or um, are sending in uh, questions to Texan by Nature staff to go ahead and do that, and we looks like we may have some questions coming in. Or questions from the, from the gallery here. Thank you. I probably won't phrase this very skillfully, but the Respect Big Bend plan, I don't know if you've gotten to solutions or recommendations for private landowners and businesses working in the area, but if you have, are there any mitigation strategies for private landowners who might be putting wind or solar on their lands? Am I on? I'm on. Okay. Great question. Um, we, we are at a stage right now with the Tri-County Plan, the Brewster, Jeff Davis, and Presidio uh, Stakeholder Advisory Group plan that the report will be coming out hopefully in May. There will be recommendations tied to that, uh, to that plan. And yeah, it's, it's I don't want to, I can't really speak heavily to those until we have fully vetted that, that report. But the idea is that we would provide a resource for, uh, a, a, a permanent resource for, for landowners and uh, industry to have access to these values that they've come up with, this, this decision support tool, if you will, of the, uh, the map of the values, and also provide, hopefully have enough capacity to provide one-on-one -on -one consultation with those individuals, look at strategies for mitigation and minimization. I can tell you that the, in the Tri-County area, I think Melinda talked about this briefly, but the, the projections for significant oil and gas development in that region, at least in those three counties, is not a lot right now. There's not, the, the geology, with the current technology, the, the geology does not uh, lend itself to a significant amount of development, not to say it won't happen in the future, which is why we want this malleable, dynamic tool to continue through time whenever those technologies do uh, occur. But there is a significant amount of opportunity, especially for solar development in those three counties. So uh, the idea being that we would work with industry and landowners to kind of minimize that footprint or uh, move the siting to areas that would not impact those values as they were laid out by the uh, stakeholder advisory group. Um, hopefully, the idea is that we will have a, uh, the capacity to do so. I hope that addressed your question. Uh, this is addressed to Sarah. Um, congratulations, you do wonderful work. And I noted that you indicated that you are the chief cook, the bottle washer, and everything <laughs> there. Um, about a year ago, Sarah, I heard a very disturbing statistic that I, I just can't shake. And that was that children bear about 81% of the brunt of our environmental issues. It, and, and I just can't shake that, but it, it makes it even more important what you're doing. But my, my question to you is, um, have you all considered or do you envision perhaps expanding or dealing with the, the, the quality of the environment, the school environments, uh, and the nature environments that the children are in? 
making sure that they are free of pollution as much as possible or that they are healthy? So while we don't focus on that entirely, um, we do know that going back to the green schoolyards, the, the campuses that have a lot of green space are um, their heat uh, in those spaces is lower. Um, we've seen a drastic temperature difference. Um, we know that in terms of um, air quality, it's, it's better because there's all um, the plants and there's carbon sequestration that's happening in those spaces. Um, and so we're seeing some positive um, aspects of, of that through putting in those green schoolyards. We also know in terms of um, water and uh, storm runoff that those green spaces um, are making those campuses safer because it's absorbing that water as opposed to it running down the sidewalk. Um, and so we see a lot of those positive aspects through um, our green schoolyards. Um, so I hope that answered your question somewhat. So thank you. And then we actually have a question from the Slack channel um, for Billy. We had somebody ask, what recommendations would you make um, for somebody who wanted to start a collaborative like yours for other ecoregions in Texas? Like, are there any best practices for getting groups together or starting an initiative similar to yours? That's a great question. I would say, you know, my, my history, you know, I'm retired from Texas Parks and Wildlife Department and I uh, was involved in a lot of collaborative conservation efforts with that organization and with our, with our conservation partners. I, I would say that the one thing that has really stood out in this is having a, a, uh, a partner like the Mitchell Foundation who has, you know, uh, had this vision and, and was able to stand up the capacity to make it happen. I think having those conversations with uh, either uh, you know, philanthropy groups or business interests that have, an, have a shared vision as well, because it really boils down to having capacity. You know, a, a lot of what, and I think that's for all, I mean, all the conservation wranglers probably every year say the same thing. It's the ability to have the capacity to move forward with these, with these ideas. Uh, this is obviously is a very unique uh, conservation Collaborative. I've been involved in conservation planning for, for many years, different different things that we've done, but to bring in the community and the landowners in addition to conservation partners is something that's unique. And, and to be able to pull that together, you really have to have um, the, the, um, the capacity, the resources to make it happen because it's difficult. It's very difficult for conservation partners or even individual volunteers to find that amount of time and, and resources to make it happen. So that'd be my number one recommendation. We were very blessed to have that opportunity through the Mitchell Foundation and others with this one. So a question in for uh, Marathon Petroleum, and some of you may have noticed that's not Karen Beadle there. <laughs> that's uh, VJ Smith. So um, question for VJ. Uh, uh, for a nonprofit that were to approach an a organization like Marathon and try to develop some kind of collaboration, what's some be best practices or advice that you could give that nonprofit so that, that that approach would be the most productive? Well, we, we look for a, a number of things in our and our par partnerships, and, and by the way, collaborative conservation is, is really an extension of our shared value approach to doing business and engaging our communities. So it's, it's kind of become visceral to us that, that we approach things with a shared value um, uh, mindset. And so you know, basically uh, a conservation group for collaborative conservation can take advantage of that, right? They can they can know that we want to collaborate and we, we appreciate collaboration on a lot of levels. Um, a big part of that is we um, are very concerned about engaging our employees. For instance, at, at our Galveston Bay refinery, we have what we call the HEART organization, which stands for Habitat Enhancement Awareness and Recycling Team. And so wh whatever we can do in a partnership that brings the leadership of our employees to the forefront, that's that's critical to us. So. Um, to have that built into a program um, when approaching uh, Marathon Petroleum is, is very, very important. Um, and then we certainly um, are looking for, for um, projects that, um, you know, for instance, the Nature Conservancy um, 
there, there's some aspects of that pro project that we're very happy with. For instance, the, the, the Nature Conservancy Texas City Prairie um, Preserve protects about 200,000 tons of carbon on that preserve. They also are harvesting 5,000 pounds of native seeds, so they, they can grow and expand um, wetlands in other areas, and we're supporting uh, wetland um, growth uh, throughout the nation with other partners like Ducks Unlimited as well. So things like that are very important. Um, if we can um, be involved, um, you know, also with um, oversight of the grant with, again, having leadership from our team involved in grant oversight or, or maybe even advisory board positions, um, we, we're very willing to open up our, roll up our sleeves with our partners and, um, and, and uh, be, be directly involved in we, we don't we don't like to just put money out there, but we like to to make sure we're engaged at all levels. Um, but I, I'll I'll punt over to Karen to see if she wants to add some color to that. Gotta unmute myself. Thanks so much for the question. Um, yeah, just to just build briefly on what um, I agree with everything that BJ said. I think um, you know for us thinking about how we approach grant making from the company perspective, where our approach is very much focused on where we operate. So less about sort of, you know, the, the big company brand and, you know, big sort of signature partnerships. We really are looking for, for collaborative projects and we want to be engaged. We want our teams to be engaged. Um, we do have, we've, we have had a focus area. One of our focus areas for our community investment has always been environment, but we're actually going to be Kind of stepping up our game in that space as well. We're going to be focused more on strategic sustainability. So, in that you know, in that respect, I think there's there there will be even more opportunities for collaborative conservation. And and this concept is fantastic. When I mean, we're actually like doing things, we're making a difference. We're also interested in thought partnership and and research and and you know, looking at um, you know some of the sort of you know behind the scenes work that's happening to drive best practice practices and the science behind all of this but you know then we're looking we're also looking at projects where we can actually make a tangible difference in the areas where we operate so um, and love love partnerships we don't want to be the only ones out in front um, we look for partners that have a you know a sustained model where they're partnering with a number of different organizations so all of that works really really well for us This is another question for um, for you guys. And first, I want to commend you for all of your work at Marathon, uh, that what you guys are doing. And and in order to encourage others in that space to do the, the same great work that you guys are doing, I'm curious, how do you measure the return on investment? So everything that you guys are doing, um, in order to be able to, to showcase that, that it actually is improving either your bottom line or um, employee engagement or, you know, what that metric is. Um, I wonder if you could share that for our audience. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, that's something that we are, you know, continually focused on. We, we look at, you know, there are, are different types of measurements, right? You can measure the actual actions that you're taking, which, which we do um, and we track and try to be, you know, we're, we're trying to be more methodical about that because we have a lot of projects in a lot of different places and our grant making is pretty high volume. Um, so we're looking at, you know, building dashboards to measure, you know, with the actions that we're taking, the partnerships that we have. But in addition to that, more and more we're focusing on outcomes. So who are the actual uh, constituents that we're trying to reach? Who are you know, we're, what are the shared goals that we have with the various organizations that we're partnering with and how do we sort of lay out that, those goals from the beginning in partnership with the organizations and then look at ways to track that over time. So how many people were impacted? How many, uh, you know, how did conditions improve um, and, and how do we measure that? You know, we've traditionally had in our grant making also a focus on STEM. So, you know, you can measure some STEM outcomes, you know, how did children sort of move through school and adopt, um, you know, STEM into their curriculum? What were the outcomes there? What were the career outcomes? From an environmental conservation and sustainability standpoint, it's really about what was the impact that you made both, you know, in the, in the natural setting, but also with the people, the constituents who actually benefit. I loved 
Sarah, I loved your presentation. I loved how you really made that about, this is about people, right? And for, and for you in particular, it's about children and, and how they benefit um, from, from conservation and how this, the work that you're doing reaches the people, reaches them. So there's a human element to it as well. So outcomes, you know, change conditions, um, you know, new opportunities, those are the types of things, but we can't measure those things on our own. We have to partner with the organizations to identify what specifically are the goals. And then, you know, through that process, then map out, you know, what are the metrics that we want to capture? And from a business standpoint, you know, we've made a pretty strong case for how this continues to enable the most critical relationships that we have that are part of our social license to operate. So that's really how we, we measure that. Um, you know, we, we actually, we put a value on shared value um, and it's not always a quantifiable dollar amount, but there's certainly, um, you know, from a business standpoint, of course, reputation matters, but more than that, it's about relationships, right? And what are the relationships that you need to continue to do, to continue to enable us to do the work that we do? I hope that helps. Great, our next question is for the city of San Antonio. Um, what is the most significant nature-based solution contributing to your climate action plan? That's a great question. So I'm going to actually um, say that it's the power of collaboration because we have so many initiatives and we're such a big giant jurisdiction that it really takes a lot of um, a lot of partnerships to to work on these things together. So the three um, projects that I highlighted in my presentation are just a sampling of some of the recent initiatives that we have done. But you can see, I think I put a slide on each one of them, the number of people and organizations that are involved in each one of them. So I think in our realm, um, local city government, our role is uh, policy. And the fact that we do have a climate plan is kind of an overarching um, initiative that will tie all of these efforts together and also give the backing for decision makers, our elected officials, to um, you know, turn back to that adopted policy so that they can have the, the backing and also the support from the advocacy groups to pursue these policies that do protect. The three E's of sustainability, which are um, the economy, equity and the environment. This is for San Antonio also. In the beginning of the legislative session, there was some talk about the legislature passing a bill that would make individual cities climate action plans illegal. Has that happened or is that still in the works? Or did I just dream that I up? Yes, I believe it's still under consideration. Um, there are a lot of bills at the legislature about local control. So we're watching those very carefully. But ultimately, um, climate action is a global effort. And so we're all going to need to take responsibility at all levels um, to really address this, this threat to our very existence. Um, so hopefully there will be um, the, the vision that um, individuals on up to um, state, local, and national governments will have the ability to really um, look at their local communities and put in place um, policy programs and projects that can address uh, local, local efforts with the overall goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and then adapting to those changes in the climate that are gonna be occurring really no matter what we do. You're over there, okay. Uh, one, one more question for uh, Julia at the City of San Antonio. This question just in from someone that lives in San Antonio. Uh, the, the land bridge is quickly becoming one of the most uh, innovative uh, uh, tourist stops in San Antonio. Out of all of the projects that you could have done at Phil Hardberger Park or any of the other parks, how did the city decide on that land bridge? Well, this, this project goes back more than a decade. Um, at the time, Mayor Phil Hardberger decided to um, save some really prime urban land within the city of San Antonio for, to become a, an urban park. 
and in so doing, um, they conserved a total of 311 acres that is divided by a major thoroughfare in the city of San Antonio. So we have these two sections of an urban park um, that are really critically important um, for wildlife and natural habitat, as well as human recreation, but they're divided by this really busy thoroughfare. So the land bridge was part of the um, original master plan of the park. It required a lot of fundraising um, to, to make it happen. That's why it took almost 10 years from the inception of the park to finally get to this point. So a lot of um, public and private monies were cobbled together to, um, to make it happen. And I, I can say that it's um, in the news, people are loving it. Um, I'm not sure if the wildlife have discovered it yet, but um, I'm sure they'll be monitoring that to see how it's working. That's great. And a question for Billy. Um, in respect, Big Bend, how, how did you go about assembling your stakeholder group? And what did you learn that you could, maybe lessons learned for, for other projects? So I, th that's perfect because I felt like I left part of the last question unanswered. And that was, and I don't want to, you know, I work for Borderlands Research Institute now at the Sol Ross State University. I don't want to toot our horn too much, but one, another thing that we did to, to stand this group, this effort up from a local perspective was you, you need a, a good convener, local convener. I think that's very important. And we, Borderlands Research Institute has served that, that purpose uh, pretty well. We basically uh, handpicked individuals that we knew from the community and from industry that we felt like could come together in a collaborative process. Um, I think one lesson that I've learned, and I, I, I feel like you know that was, that was one of my primary responsibilities was building the stakeholder advisory group, and, and by and large, I knew everybody on that in that group, and know them a lot better now after. And I want to commend them. I mean, 13, we're on our 14th meeting coming up, I think, and most of these meetings have lasted anywhere from uh, two to three hours or more. Um, you know, the idea to minimize politics. We're not here to change regulation or policy. Where our goal is to work within a regulatory framework that's provided to us at any given time. And it's been extremely rewarding. You know, I, I mentioned when we first started, we had some very strong liberals and conservatives in that room, and we're not going to have discussions that take us off track because at the end of the day, we all share a same vision. And this vision was, has been brought forth with the, the values that they've, they've, they've recommended plus the um, the recommendations that will come out of this group. And I want to be clear also on that previous question as well, that, you know, I don't know if Melinda made that clear or not, but we're not done yet. You know, this is, this is a tri-county effort. Um, one of the concerns they've had is, is their values being extrapolated to the entire 18-county region. We're moving into those other counties where there is more active development occurring and planned, and hopefully we'll have the same, the same strategy. And those, those communities and those landowners may have a different uh, set of values, but we're going to try to, to work together with them and figure out what's important to them. And the idea is eventually that we can, we can utilize this process across the state or across the country uh, once we continue to see results. I think that's part of it is engagement with our landowner and conservation partners, because ultimately right now, the way it is in, in Texas, there's three entities, we've been very clear about, there's three entities that can make a decision on when and how energy development occurs it's the landowner, i.e. mineral owner, it's the energy developer themselves, and it's regulators. And communities and individuals don't often have a lot of say so, but through this process, they can. And so that's um, the, the goal. We're gonna to continue to work in those, in those, in those West Texas counties. Um, but you know, as far as lessons learned, it's, I can tell you this has been the most uh, rewarding process I've ever been a part of. We picked people to be on the stakeholder advisory group who are known to be collaborative, good decision makers, people who are willing to work with others for the best of their communities, for the best of their, their neighbors, and they're busy. A lot of them sit on, you know, their county commissioners, on the school board. They get asked to do this a lot, and they're extremely busy, and they all made it a point to tell me how busy they were before we made the ask. Not a single one turned us down. Not a single one said no. They all saw how important this was and wanted to be part of the process. So extremely rewarding. 
Well, congratulations on, a, on something that's going to become a model for other efforts, obviously. We have, um, we, okay. We are Time to ready. shut me up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I thank, thank you to the panel. Please, uh, please join me in thanking them. And I think we have a video and then we break for lunch. Am I correct? Okay, so we have a video, and um, this is, I believe, a Texas Children in Nature uh, presentation, and then we will break for lunch. We have about an hour and a half for lunch, so it's an opportunity for networking, and those of you that at home can uh, network also, but thank you. When my kids have too much screen time, I can really, really tell. With the younger one, he tends to prefer to play on the iPad instead of ever reading or doing schoolwork. He turns into a beast and is hangry and mad, and the other one is disconnected from the family. Five more minutes of screen time. The teachers have mentioned that they are worried about the kids being on screen too much. Texas has 10% of America's K through 12 population. That's about seven million kids. Most of them log about 50 hours a week of screen time. And about a third of those students are overweight or obese. Bottom line, there's a critical disconnect between Texas youth and the outdoors. Helping solve this problem and creating the next generation of nature-minded citizens is what Texas Children in Nature does. There are thousands of organizations working across Texas to create access to nature and nature-based programming. TCIN partners with over 500 organizations, ranging from health to education, community development, and conservation. These all form a collaborative network that drives efficiencies in providing better access to resources, nature-based programming, and best practices. It's a great support system for organizations and educators all across Texas. On an annual basis, probably around 10,000 children come through the Wildflower Center. And our goal for them is to see that flower bloom, see a cricket hop, just experience nature, have their aha moments, and eventually become that next generation of stewards of nature. Texas Children in Nature helps bring all of the organizations that work with children in nature and brings us all together. Without Texas Children in Nature, we wouldn't be connected with other organizations in our community, in the state, and national. As someone who has spent many years in the classroom, I can tell you that TCIN's network is so important, especially when it comes to resource equity. Not every region has the same access to materials and best practices. Most teachers don't even know where to start when it comes to building a green space or a natural play environment. Texas Children in Nature helps prepare the next generation of conservation-minded Texans by working through creating a love of nature. When we go outside, what I notice is that the kids are inquisitive, they talk to us, we actually have a conversation with them and they listen to, <laughs> to us and they want to learn, which is pretty amazing. And by creating a love for nature in our children, we're creating adults who care about the nature around us. We're able to live really close to the Green Belt and that's really a big part of our, our lives. We come home and it just seems like we get along a whole lot better. They're just different. That's just, they're good people. Imagine a Texas where all seven million kids go outside every day. They have access to green spaces, they get to play in nature, and they get to experience the outdoors. And maybe they learn to be caretakers of nature as they grow into adulthood. This 
is our mission at Texas Children and Nature.